Indians lay down arms after decades of tribal fighting. People's Progress Party disappointed at changes in cabinet. And Lay City FC heavy favourites in NSL semi final. This is National MTV News with Helen Sayer. Good evening and thanks for joining us for Friday's news. Clans involved in a tribal fight over land in the upper Asara area in the eastern highlands have agreed to lay down their arms after 20 years. The three clans have been fighting over a large coffee plantation. But intervention by local church pastors, police and the governor has started a process to bring peace. In the last 20 years, the Eastern Highlands has seen a gradual end to several tribal conflicts in various parts of the province. Some of the conflicts have raged on for more than three generations. This is the first time the Miruma, Namta and the Kauma Aofa people in the upper Asaro area of Daulo district have come together in one location. They are related by blood, but over 20 years they've been locked in a tribal war that caused death and destruction. Much of the work to bring peace was done by churches, the pastors, convincing the fight leaders to put aside their weapons and talk peace. To bring an end to the conflict, it also needed some political intervention. Eastern Highlands Governor Peter Numu has been to several districts in the province speaking the same message stop fighting and start building a future driven by agriculture. Fight, no got man so win. Fight, no got on man so win. Two plus five percent are lose. Two months ago in Bena, the people celebrated a decade free of tribal conflicts. It's been a difficult struggle to get to the stage. And again, much of the work was done by pastors and community leaders. Getting that message through in the Eastern Highlands has not been easy. With long-held grudges and strong tribal obligations, the provincial government has had to convince people that there is a better alternative. And if conflicts continue, they won't benefit from government support to agriculture and coffee production. When there is a tribal fight, law and order problem, how can you bring agriculture, education, health, all this like and government service going set? So I see that it's more important that we bring peace so that and order into the community so that uh, people stop good not receiving government services. And things have had to happen on multiple fronts. The provincial government set up Rumbia Coffee, forged market access to Asia and more recently to the US. Rumbia Coffee has driven up coffee prices from 1 kina 50 to 5 kina and the money is going directly to farmers, some of whom were previously involved in tribal fighting. The province will soon be producing rice with the ultimate aim of reducing dependence on imports. Scott Waide, National MTV News, Goroka. A number of alleged environment pollution complaints have been raised to the Office of the Environment and Conservation Minister Wera Mori. Speaking yesterday, Minister Mori says this includes Ramo River in Medang, Fly River in Western and also provinces where logging is currently active. The minister responsible says investigations will be established into these complaints while identifying the source of pollution. On the aquatic life. Speaking yesterday, a number of increasing complaints were raised to the department regarding alleged pollution from mining and logging activities. The environment minister says the department is concerned about this. The Ramu River is one with heavy metal deposits and will be investigated. We will soon have a team that will basically go out there to investigate The impacts of such. The Fly River in western and Strickland areas is another with sediments from the Octedi mine. SEPA intends to investigate the matter and a feasibility study to find out the root cause of the alleged pollution. Pogaram mine in Enga is also facing confronting issues. Minister Mori says the cabinet will be consulted to conduct assessment as the mining lease has been awarded to Kumul Mineral Consolidated Holdings. We must be able to start instigating procedures look for avenues and measures that could mitigate and address them. We have problems with that because both the characteristics of both the Pogora and Octavian mines 
are the same. They're refractory all. But it's not just the extractive industries. The logging industry is also hampering the natural environment. Provinces like Oro, Western, Gulf, Medang, New Island and West New Britain. For logging, SEPA and the PNG Forest will review permits if operations are not complying with regulations. We will soon be visiting a lot of provinces and if need be, we are going to withdraw their permits if they don't operate within the requirements that are outlined in the permits. Separate investigation teams will be assigned to the complaints and establish the cause of the alleged pollution reports. Jagla Pavet Jr., National MTV News. One of the country's oldest political parties, People's Progress Party, is disappointed at the government's decision to decommission Emil Tamur from his tourism portfolio. Tamur was one of two PPP members serving as ministers in the then Marpa Stephen coalition government. PPP now has Jess Johnson Tuke serving the current government as mining minister, adding to the list of seven other political parties also having just one ministry assigned to them. People's Progress Party General Secretary Moses Kaina's statement said he was disappointed with the Prime Minister's decision to decommission a member of his party, Emil Tamur, as tourism minister. Ka describes Emil Tamur as stable and a committed member. Ka recalled the moments last year when factions were lobbying to host then Prime Minister Peter O'Neill and says his small PPP group together with other small political parties gave their support resulting in the change to install James Marape as the new Prime Minister. He claims it was PPP who persuaded Peter O'Neill to step aside for Marape when he was already turned down by other coalition partners in Laguna. Mr. Carr continues his rant, saying the ministers with him now include some who didn't vote for him or even failed to vote. Prime Minister James Marpe, during the swearing-in of the new ministers yesterday, said parties were given a ministry in the ratio of one is to three. To find party balance, there needs to be a distribution of ministry that respects uh, one ministry to be allocated to three ministers per party uh, ministry sharing ratio. Uh, these two fine gentlemen had to vacate their spot in cabinet. To this, Mr. Carr said during the formation of government in May last year, every person and every vote counted and not based on a quota of one is to three. He adds that despite the party's efforts, PPP has lost two ministries it enjoyed with the previous O'Neill government and accuses the Marape government of ignoring and devaluing the party's significance in the formation of his government. However, Carr said Marape as the Prime Minister had the prerogative to make such decisions and while they accept it, he said they parliamentary party leader and the party's founding father, Sir Julius Chen, assistant politician, will make the concerns known to the government in due course and that the party will make better judgment next time. Ruth Rongola, National MTV News. A senior public servant holding a senior position in a state agency was arrested and charged yesterday by members of the special investigation team comprising PNG Immigration and Citizenship Authority and Police National Fraud and Anti-Corruption Directorate. The senior public servant was locked up at Kundiawa police cells for obstruction and interference. Seven foreigners were also arrested for breaching immigration laws and locked up in the police cells together with the senior public servant. The senior public servant flew in from Port Moresby and was trying to interfere and obstruct the special investigation team from conducting routine inspection on foreign owned businesses. He was alleged to have used his position and interest in the company to prevent the inspection and apprehension of one of the foreign workers who had discrepancies in his documents. You're watching National MTV News. We'll be back with more stories after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back. A 30-year-old mine worker in the Western Province is the latest person to test positive for COVID-19 in the last 24 hours. This brings Papua New Guinea's total COVID-19 cases to 539. The male worker who resides in a settlement on the fringes of Tabubil town is the third confirmed case in that particular area. 
Controller of the National Pandemic Response, David Manning, says the confirmation of the third case in the same area indicates likely transmission in communities outside of the mine. To date, Western Province has 191 confirmed cases. PNG has tested 25,955 persons for coronavirus. An additional 202 samples are pending laboratory results and there are 10 active cases currently in isolation. So far, 519 persons have recovered, whilst death from COVID-19 remains at seven. The Ogoni Dabunari land group from Borehoho Baroni village has threatened to destroy power pylons put up by PNG Power for the LNG plant site unless their grievances are addressed. They are seeking two things, ILG certification and spin-off benefits. It is now 17 years of trying to obtain an incorporated land group or ILG certificate from the Lands Department. The Ogoni Dabu Nari land group from Bore Hoho Baruni village has had enough of silently fighting this battle. Something like that, 17 years I've been struggling, going, coming, going, coming all the time. And I thought I was going to get a good answer from the Lands Department, the director of the ILG, but uh, nothing. Until now, until now I saw. The failure by the Lens Department to address their concerns now forces them to resort to issuing threats. They have threatened to destroy power pylons set up by PNG Power leading to the PNG LNG plant site. Legitimate Ogoni Dabunari clan owners residing at Boru, Biasidaha and Baruni are frustrated because the former ILG registrar, Mr. Iruna Rogakila, never assisted them to process and release their ILG certificate. In order to enable payment of outstanding benefits and spin-off spending from phase one of the power pylon project headed by PNC Power, running through our land site has not been met and we've never benefited from any of these spin-offs. Phase two of the PNG Power project is yet to commence. The clan says that the project will not go ahead unless the Lens Department and PNG Power addresses their concerns. The landowners will not negotiate any new agreements with PNG Power Limited and Coffee Services for Phase Two, Project B, if they do not receive any satisfactory responses from Department of Lands and Physical Planning and PNG Power in relation to the issuance of their ILG certificate to access their outstanding benefits and spin-offs held in trust with PNC Power. Attempts to get comments from the Lens Department were unsuccessful. Meanwhile, PNG Power said they will issue a response once they sought clarification. The Ogoni Dabunari clan has been living in this part of Port Mosby for over 50 years. Between 1969 and 1970, the clan together with other clans of Barone village have had to go to court to prove their existence in this part of Port Mosby in the case Sina versus administration of the territory of Papua New Guinea. Anat Kora, National MTV News. Two East New Britain province workers at the East New Britain Development Corporation today petitioned the provincial government. They are demanding transparency within the company's administration. Meanwhile, Governor Nakikus Konga, who received the petition, told those who gathered that the business arm of the provincial government hasn't been making money over the years. The petition comes four days after the termination of Isaac Menikas as the executive chairman of East New Britain Development Corporation following allegations of maladministration. Earlier today, workers from various sections of the East New Britain Development Corporation gathered outside the main ENBDC office and presented their petition to the East New Britain Governor Nakikus Konga. The workers demanded transparency and accountability within the company's administration. Any grievance on uh, uh, the outgoing uh, executive uh, chairman uh, by Macedonian uh, due process. Uh, and, uh, Restore him uh, some black confidence uh, along uh, all general staff. Governor Konga, while receiving the petition, applauded the workers for taking a stand against the maladministration, an issue that has dragged on within the company for many years. <laughs> But those people, 
in the top bracket management, they will be more of a in the salary. On Monday, the company's chairman Isaac Minikos was terminated after failing to comply with certain regulation of the company. Governor Conga, who acts as the proxy shareholder of ENBDC, the business arm of the East Newburton provincial government, told those who gathered today that the company isn't making money. In fact, a financial report presented during the company's annual board meeting last year have indicated that the company has made an accumulated loss of more than 1 million kina in revenue since 2014. The impacts of the financial downturns have resulted to inconsistency in paying its workforce and funding the operation of the company. I was looking at the issue of the corporation of supporting me. So really bad that he come down, so I can be able to fix the road. I asked myself a question, why 19 years when William Lamar was here, they have not paid one single toy here to the provincial government of his prison, which is about the undertaking of the people, the 420,000 of the deputy government of Pinsonogeni. We never received any dividends, nothing whatsoever. Since taking office three years ago, Governor Konga has called for a reshuffle to the company's executive management. The governor's call follow instances of no proper management of company records. Master Minikus, who was appointed to replace William Lamour as the new chairman, has yet again failed to achieve results, the governor says. We've been with William Lamour, and we with the hope that by proof on situations, no company here. Because for the last 20 years, 18 years, you have not paid us any dividend, not even one single lousy toy. You may work hard, but because something you don't want up, Tampolong you may fall to one day. The East New Britain Development Corporation comprises mainly stevedoring, supermarkets and real estate businesses. The company is now under an interim chairman, added by Levi Mano as the company awaits the appointment of a new chairman. Edwin Fidelis, National MTV News, Kokopo. Locals in inland Macau of Central Province have been urged to register their land and business group. Karukuhiri MP Peter Isoaimo made these remarks while introducing initiatives of establishing a replica of traditionally built Macau village setting. Isoaimo says though challenges remain, people must be eager to tap into this opportunity. The inlands of Karukuhiri in the Macau areas remained untouched for years. This part of central province boasts some of the traditional myths of early establishment. A visit to the area recently grasped the opportunity to turn this place into a tourism hub. We have to turn this place around into something else. Tourism is a, is a million kina business. Tourism is everyone's business. We need to tap into it now. The concept is to create a maker village model where tourists will visit and get a feel of the local settings. A house built by a Catholic priest is now the center of attention to be maintained and support the tourist project proposal. We can turn into this one into a guest house, both bottom, uh, top and bottom, with a little office and reception, and we are into business, we trade. Though distance, poor road conditions and rough terrains remain a challenge, the push to support such project is imminent. The serving MP says the District Development Authority will assist if locals are organized by registering the land, business name and others. Isoaimo says agriculture and tourism remain the economic drive for the people. We want to do, I want us to do a replica of Mekeo here. Abu Kenga, Angoi Nanga, Pia Pia, you do one house each, traditionally built house representing one Mekeo village or one rural village. Jack Lopawa Jr. National MTV News. And now looking at the NASFUND market report, the Kina closed five points lower at 0 0.2940 US dollars in the interbank market this morning. At Bank South Pacific, your Kina is buying 0 0.2785 US dollars, 0 0.3844 Australian dollars, 0 0.2293 Euro and 28.7 Japanese yen. Looking at commodity prices at New York close, gold is trading lower, coffee and copra closed higher, cocoa closed lower. Crude oil is trading lower, palm oil closed lower and copper closed higher. 
And on the stock market, the Dow Jones closed at 329.04 points higher. The ASX 200 is trading at 84.1 points higher. And the All Ordinaries is trading at 83.9 points higher. The National MTV News continues with more stories after these messages. Stay with us. Welcome back to the news. The bus stop award and program in NCD has again received support from the National Capital District Commission and other stakeholders. The bus stop award and program was an initiative of NCD and Pacific Corporate Security to have security personnel stationed at various bus stops to help minimize crimes committed. Today, a vehicle was presented to the Pacific Corporate Security to support this program. In a small ceremony today, a brand new Toyota Hilux was presented to support the bus stop wedding initiative. The vehicle will help address the challenges security personnel are facing in this program. Various stakeholders also participated to show their support for the program. The stakeholders include St. John's Ambulance, Road Traffic Authority and the police. The initiative of the bus stop warden, as you know, NCDC cannot do all its job on its own, okay? It needs the partnership. It needs that partnership, very, very important. Okay, you know, the city is growing. The city of about, people say almost about a million people, okay, in the city is a very, very challenging task. The bus stop warden initiative was launched three months ago aimed at reducing petty crimes at bus stop areas. Under this program, security personnel from Pacific Corporate Security are stationed at bus stop areas to maintain security. According to PCS principal owner Jacob Kauper, they have achieved a lot. However, their challenges include resources and manpower. We request uh, the greater participation from the stakeholders. You know what you are before you, you know what you can do to assist what role you can play to enhance this program forward. Apart from maintaining security at bus stop areas, the wardens were also tasked to ensure bus stop areas are clean and to manage traffic congestions. Rugby league team Port Mosby Vipers is also advocating against gender-based violence and other issues through their sport. If we all respect each other, so if the government cannot give us more policemen and women, then it's up to us to change our mindset, change our attitude. And that's, that's what the NCDC, under my leadership as chairman and as governor of our capital city, has been working towards. It's not easy to change behavior. In support for the program, Metropolitan Superintendent Pero Drono called for more public-private partnership to help address law and order issues in the city, adding that everyone must contribute to ensure peace and safety in communities. And city police will do our best to respond when required to assist the warrants at the bus stop. The challenge now is for the public. If you want peace, help us provide the peace at the bus stops. Rayon Lakingu National, MTV News. And turning overseas, once the epicenter of coronavirus in Europe, Italy is now being hailed for barking the trend of countries seeing a spike in cases. Italy's infection rates are amongst the lowest in Europe. A new initiative by Italy to ease the pain of Generation Covid with drive-through testing for children. Rapid negative results allow them back to school. A tool by the once global epicenter, now a pioneer of COVID recovery. For lockdown, we had many problems for the kids. Italy was the first Western country crushed by the virus. Almost 36,000 have died. But now La Dolce Vita is returning. Cases are among Europe's lowest, Italy taking safety as seriously as its food, with screens, disposable menus, and contact tracing. Now they have to go in England. I have to say I'm a little scared because I feel much safer here, yes. Why do you think it is that there seems to be more compliance with the rules here than in Britain? Because we were the first and we had a very long quarantine and we really felt it. Italy is enforcing restrictions with police checks and fire but it's been rarely needed. Mask wearing is scrupulous and the national stereotype of rebellious Italians has turned on its head. They did follow the rules, uh, but you know, the, the war is not over yet. That fight goes on with mass testing starting at schools. 
Whether it is the widespread availability of testing, the longer lockdown, or just that Italians were scared into compliance, it's actually hard to pinpoint exactly why Italy's spike is currently lower than others. But the fear now is that by reopening schools later than the rest of Europe, Italy might just be behind the curve. So Italy is on alert, but the first to fall now hopes to show others how to stay standing. There's a warning against compliances around bushfires with summer on the way in Australia. After a devastating fire season, authorities are pleading with people to be prepared. The fire season started in the state's north two months ago. Now it's time for the rest of the state. On the back of losing more than 2,400 homes, 11,000 fires, um, we need to make sure we can do better. You, know, you watch the news, you see horrible things happen, but it always seems to happen to other people. Jim Hughes lost his home in Batemans Bay on New Year's Eve. He's now encouraging people to prepare for the worst. To be honest, I didn't think it was going to get as far as it did. I thought we, we really thought we could stop it from what we'd done to prepare. Um, I was naive. The fires hit when most were on holidays in areas they didn't know well, and 100,000 called triple zero. And uh, the, the most uh, standout feature from that was people not knowing where they were. Fire authorities are encouraging everyone to download an Emergency Plus app which offers an exact location. For those in the Central West, West and North West, there's the forecast of grass fires. Even though the forecast is for a wetter than average summer, the threat of bushfires remains real. George Pell has returned to the Vatican for the first time since he was cleared for child sex charges. He said it was great to be back, but it wasn't a warm welcome. He left Rome an accused pedophile, but returned a vindicated VIP. Cardinal George Pell, flanked by Vatican officials, arriving at Fiumicino Airport three years after he left to clear his name. Anything to say to the Australian victims of child sex abuse at the hands of the Catholic Church? The 79-year-old was driven straight to his apartment, where he's now self-isolating. Lovely to be back. The feeling wasn't mutual for at least one Melbourne woman waiting outside. We hate you! We hate you! He's destroyed the church in Australia. It's understood Pell plans to meet with Pope Francis privately, their first face-to-face -face since 2017. He still has all the rights and duties of the cardinal. Pell's original plan was a brief trip to clean out his apartment, but friends may convince him to stay longer, possibly until his 80th birthday next June. As night falls here in Rome, the attention shifts to how this will affect the Pope. It's no secret George Pell has enemies within the Vatican, and insiders say if the pontiff is seen to be publicly endorsing him, he risks losing the support of cardinals, bishops, and many Catholics. His presence here would create even more tensions. And Chukai Sports is next. Here's Kilawani with a preview of tomorrow's NSL semi final. Yes, Helen. Lay FC, the favourites, will go up against Gulf Kumar. We'll also have game fishing and basketball. Join me for the details after the break. Chukai Sports Welcome to Chukai Sports. Lay City FC are heavy favourites in tomorrow's semi-finals fixtures against Gulf Komar. Having lost only one game the entire season and with the best defending players in the league, Gulf will have a tough task against the NSL's defending champions. The other semi-finals fixtures is between Hekari and VTS United. Lay City will be heading into this match riding on the back of big wins over other clubs. Suffering only a single loss throughout the season and they face a Gulf Kamara side whom they've scored six goals against. Emmanuel Simon brings his team out. Eliud Fugre as well. 
With Philip Steven and Alwyn Komolong holding that strong defense, Gulf will need to utilize their creativity and speed up front to provide any sort of real threat. Emmanuel Simon and Jacob Sabua, both having played together in the midfield for Papua New Guinea, have been informed this season, providing a host of attacking opportunities for their side. Sabua. Gulf Kumar had left it till quite late to qualify for the semi-finals, that big 5-0 victory over Star Mountains last week, seeing them leapfrog two Spub Stallions for that crucial fourth spot. Makes it four! Jordan Coven and Palapol will provide for them much needed impetus going forward and will be the go-to players in this semi-finals match. Coven, whose hat-trick last week in the decisive qualifier, will have to dig deep as he goes against Lay Strong, a tower in defense. The second semi-finals fixture will see Vitius and Hekari meet. Both sides have been evenly matched the whole season. Having had two draws, Hekari will go into this match as slight favorites. Having had consecutive wins, with Vitius coming off the back of two losses and a draw. Vitiers have had very few changes for their starting 11 this season, with the league's top scorer Jonathan Allen only missing one match, while Hecker's constantly rotating squad has left punters guessing. Yagi Yasasa and Eliud Fugre in Vitiers midfield were unable to dominate in last week's draw against Leigh City and question remains on the availability of defender Joshua Talao, who was stretched off. Hekari have few concerns, with PNG strikers Raymond Gunemba, Nigel Dabinyaba and Kolu Kepo expected to start. But it is in the back line where Hekari have looked less convincing and most footballers know to win games you have to defend your goal. Might have a chance to shoot, they do so, Tomara slips! And there it is, FC Marbella Wawans have pulled one back! The matches will kick off at 12.50 p.m. on Saturday, simulcast live on MTV and MTV Online. The New Britain Game Fishing Club, in partnership with Total Waste Management, will host the first game fishing competition for 2020. The announcement comes following the annual general meeting on the 13th September. The two days billfish competition will start tomorrow, 3rd October, and run through to the 4th. Target species for the competition are billfish, specifically marlin and sailfish. Prize categories include HPS male, HPS female and HPS junior. All Game Fishing Association rules apply. All proceeds from the competition will go to the Cancer Foundation. And Trukai, continues, Trukai Sports continues with more stories after the break. Trukai Sports Welcome back to Trukai Sports. To Super Rugby, Rugby-Owned Players Association is tonight calling out New Zealand rugby over the lack of a Pacifica team in next year's Super Rugby competition. In fact, the association says there's deeper disappointment in the Pacific community. It's another heated issue for the game following on from the rugby championship issues. Yesterday, New Zealand Rugby announced Super Rugby Aotearoa will be back with the same five teams in 2021. But the Players Association says they've jumped the gun and that plans for a Pacifica team should still be looked at. Bottom line is, if not now, when? For 26 years, Pacifica have missed out. You know, they deserve this opportunity. They're a massive contribution. 40% of our Super Rugby players are Pacifica. NZR chairman Brent Impey says he does want a Pacifica team, but the NZR board concluded that Pacifica options just weren't feasible for 2021. One of the teams, Moana Pacifica, is reportedly led by former All Black great Sir Brian Williams. They put in a terrific amount of effort and they are highly respected. The issue for New Zealand rugby was both on the field, could the team be competitive in 2021, and off the field because we were not in a position to be able to subsidise. Whereas this way, we uh, hopefully will get a really top top notch Pacifica team in for 2022. But Nichols says a recent study conducted by Deloitte proved a Pacifica team is achievable for next year. And then the next step, a part of that, was to bring all the parties around the table and say, if we act in an inclusive way and we act together, we could stand this up. Problem is, there was no one backing it. Uh, there was no corporate support. The only 
potential support was us. We need to do this for Pacifica. We've got an opportunity to do it now. We need to work harder to deliver. We will definitely be having uh, talks with uh, with the groups involved in trying to get together a Pacifica team, but it'll be for 2022. Super Rugby aside, the All Blacks have welcomed news from across the Tasman that a limited travel bubble could mean no quarantine for the team upon arrival in Australia. It opens up the possibility that uh, the games that were supposedly scheduled for December the 12th can be moved and so it's good news in terms of that. Reigniting All Blacks hopes for a Christmas at home instead of in quarantine while the hopes of a Pacifica Super Rugby team hang in the balance. A US soccer team has given away a chance of making the finals by standing up to homophobia. San Diego loyal midfielder Colin Martin who is openly gay was allegedly insulted by a player from Phoenix Rising. Kicking homophobia into touch and out of U.S. soccer. All right, folks, San Diego is walking off the field. Despite holding a 3-1 lead and being on track for a place in the USL Championship playoffs, the San Diego loyal walked away from it all in support of teammate Colin Martin, the openly gay midfielder, the alleged target of a homophobic slur from Phoenix Rising player Junior Flemings. Martin's coach, United States legend Landon Donovan, taking matters into his own hands. We have to get this out of our game. Donovan stormed the pitch after Martin had been red carded and challenged the match officials. Guys, he said, listen, he said something in a language that I don't understand. I don't understand what that means. The sending off was overturned, but Donovan was furious with the referee's lack of action over the slur understood to be in Jamaican slang. That proved to be no empty threat. After half time, his players took a knee before leaving the pitch altogether. No one's going to remember if we beat Phoenix 3 1 at home, right? That's like, no one's going to remember that. They will remember that they stood up for something they believed in and they supported their teammate. It's not the first time the Loyal have taken a stand. Last week, San Diego forfeited a game after one of the African American players was racially abused. Donovan's words are a reflection of a nation that's increasingly divided. There's things more important in life and we have to stick up for, for what we believe in. US soccer officials say they're now investigating the incident. And Trukai Sports ends there. Helen will be back with the weather forecast for the next 24 hours. Have a great weekend in sports. Trukai Sports. This weather update is proudly brought to you by MoniPlus. With you always. A look at the weather forecast for tonight and tomorrow in the southern region. Partly cloudy with light showers and drizzles in Port Moresby. A few showers and windy conditions in Daru. Occasional rain showers and possible thunder in Kerama and Popandita. And occasional thundery showers in Alotau. In the Mombasa region, cloudy with occasional rain showers and drizzles in Lee, occasional thunder and rain showers in Medang and Wewak, and occasional rain showers in Vanimok. In the New Guinea Islands region, occasional thunder and rain showers in Lorengau, a few showers, then partly cloudy in Kavian, Kokopo and Rabaul, thundery rain showers, then cloudy periods in Kimbe and cloudy with evening rain showers in Buka. And in the Highlands region, occasional rain showers, then cloudy periods right across the region in Mount Hagen, Goroka, Kundiawa, Mendi and Wabeg. There is a renewal strong wind warning for all the coastal waters of Kiwai Islands to Kikori and from Cape Rodney to Samari Island, including eastern Milne Bay Islands from East Cape to Tufi through Vitias and Dampier Straits to CRC and Long Islands to Karkat Island to Manam Island and southwest of the Bismarck Sea. 
Strong east to southeast winds of 25 to 33 knots with gusts of 40 knots are expected to persist for the next 24 hours, causing rough and high seas. All small crafts and boats are advised to take necessary precautions before going out to sea in the warning areas. There is also a renewed gale force winds warning for the coastal waters of southern PNG Indonesian border to Daru through the Gulf of Papua to Yul Island to Hood Point and including the waters of the Coral Sea. East to southeast gale force winds surge of 20, 34 to 47 knots are expected to persist for the next 24 hours causing very rough and high seas. All small crafts and boats are advised to stay away from the mentioned areas during the forecast period. Forecast for small crafts for the next 24 hours. Waters of southern PNG Indonesian border through Torres Strait to Daru to Kerama to Yul Island at to Hood Point and Samari Island seas of 2.5 to 3.5 meters. Waters of eastern and western Milne Islands with waters of Long Island to Karkar Island including waters of Wiwak to Aitape to the northern PNG Indonesian border, seas of 1.5 to 2.5 meters. Waters of Samari Island to East Cape to Cape Fogo through Huon Gulf to Finchhafen, including waters of Manus and its western group of islands, seas of 0.5 to 1.5 meters. Waters of Finchhafen through Vityas and Ampia Straits to Siasi and Long Island, seas of 2 to 3 meters. Waters of New Ireland to East New Britain and Bougainville seas of 0.5 to 1.3 meters and waters of West New Britain seas of 1.5 to 2 meters. A look at the ocean forecast for PNG areas in the Coral Sea. Seas very rough with southeast winds at 30 to 45 knots. In the Solomon Sea, seas slight to moderate with northeast winds, northeast to easterly winds at 10 to 20 knots. In the Bismarck Sea, seas slight to moderate to patches rough with east to southeasterly winds at 10 to 15 knots, increasing to 30 knots to the south and southwest. And in the Pacific Ocean, sea slight with east to southeasterly winds at 10 to 15 knots. The weather update was proudly brought to you by Money Plus. With you always. And that's been the news, sport and weather for today, Friday the 2nd of October 2020. On behalf of the entire MTV News team, have a safe weekend, pleasant viewing, good night.